where all the dealers were at that time. And uh, it's kind of an amazing thing when you think about it that this is 1954, this picture was taken. The, the amount of coordination that took, you had to work with the, the, the factory when they were going to have those bailers produced and ready to ship out. You had to work with the railroad to, uh, when, okay, when could we have those here? And then you had to get all the dealers to come to Lincoln to t take this photo opportunity. Uh, to require a lot of coordination. So uh, next year they did the same thing again. So here it actually was snow on the ground. Uh, they had dealers do that all again, and they had another train load of bail bailers that came into Lincoln there for the Lincoln branch, and uh, then it was sent out to the dealers after that. Uh, other things going on in the 50s, the, uh, you had three new tractor series during this time. The H&M were retired, and then uh, that was Super M, and then came out with the 100 series, which was the 400, 300, and 400. Uh, then a couple years later, the 150, the 150 series, or the 450, 350, 450. And then by the end of the decade, they were in the 40 and 60 series, the introduction, the, the 460, 560, 340s uh, came out. Um, of course, as we all know, the 460 and 560 had some issues on the transmissions, uh, having some problems, and I, my grandfather remembers was, was actually involved in, in going through all that warranty work and uh, the recalls and retrofit to get those transmissions repaired so they wouldn't have problems. So now we're going to the 60s. Uh, and uh, the fourth generation of Schmitz was added to the family. There's, my, there's me and uh, my grandma that was holding me there, and uh, my grandpa and dad and mom. Uh, we were still selling ag. We had a full line of ag and uh, motor truck. We were selling pickups and medium duty trucks primarily. Also, in our area in the 50s, irrigation starts developing. And so, to par provide power to those wells, uh, we started selling the industrial power units, the irrig irrigation motors. And uh, also we supplied uh, irrigation pipe and supplies from various uh, suppliers that uh, we were connected with. And, uh, and, we, and we got into doing the custom hay swathing more in that time as well. Here's an aerial view of Dakin. Um, up here is where our dealership is. And this is here by the elevator is where our, our equipment lots were. We had uh, our equipment there on display for people coming through the town they could see what equipment we had on the lot for sale and uh, in the dealership up there so it's not the best picture but it, it gives you a little bit of idea other things going on in the 60s on the company level level they started some consolidations and they started closing a number of the branch offices so uh, we had like I said earlier we had two branch offices in Nebraska Lincoln and Omaha well the Lincoln office was closed and uh, consolidated in with the Omaha district. Um, the, uh, and also the Omaha district moved from downtown. It used to be right across the street from the old depot there in Omaha, which is still there. Uh, and then he moved out to, I think, K Street and built a new building there, a big warehouse and office area. Um, there were some iconic products introduced uh, in the 60s. Uh, the Scout came out in 61, of course, and the Cub Cadets. Um, the 06 tractors came out, and uh, the, then by the end of the decade, the, the 26 and 56 series tractors were all were introduced. So, so a lot of uh, very fine products were produced that, that are still working today, a lot of them. <laughs> More training. My uh, grandpa went to uh, some training on service items there uh, for hydraulics and electrical work, and there was copies of the certificates there. Uh, oh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Are you ready? Our next slide. Yeah. So here's a picture. It's a little video clip <laughs> we found. Uh, me and my grandpa. My grandpa and me were best buds, <laughs> and uh, he uh, he liked me and I liked him. We had we got along great. So there I was, a little kid, and uh, <laughs> and here is a, I'm getting my first scout. <laughs> <laughs> a little pedal scout. <laughs> There's my mom. <laughs> I wish I could see more of the background. What the, there was like an 806 there in the, in the uh, uh, background there. And there I'm trying to hook the wagon to the scout, and uh, it doesn't have a hitch, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, and so I'm trying to work through that. And anyway, there I just forget the scout and go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, that was my first scout. I still have that scout. I've got a couple more since, but. <laughs> He can't drive it either. <laughs> <laughs> the pedal scout can't drive no more. Um, also in 1969, my uh, grandfather was honored as a 55-year dealer. Uh, they had a uh, the special, uh, 
the 815 and 915 combines were introduced that year. And they had a, the Omaha district had their introduction up at Columbus, Nebraska, uh, there in February. And uh, he went to that and was honored there for recognizing his 55 years of being a dealer. And uh, the uh, 915 there in the background, you see, and then also right there where my grandfather was standing is a replica of the old McCormick Reaper. So uh, we had one of the very first early 915s built. Uh, surely it wasn't too long after that introduction, there was all one day I remember a big 915 combine showing up. And uh, I often wondered if that wasn't the combine in the background, because the serial number is 502. And uh, so usually, I think combines like tractors, they started up, you know, 501 was usually the first one. Uh, and we sold that combine to my Uncle Glenn on my mom's side of the family. And he used that combine for many years. It had some issues, uh, you know, this 915, 815 were the first models that were, we had an enclosed engine compartment. And there were some issues with the exhaust system on that and chaff would build up and it catch fire. And my Uncle Glenn's combine, unfortunately, it caught fire one time, and or actually twice, but it, it, it got it out quickly and it, he still used it. He traded in about five, six years later. And, and uh, we finally sold it again to a guy over by Beatrice, and he used it for a number of years after that. So it was it was a good combine. Yeah, it had some issues. The early ones really had some issues, but the later ones were a lot better, and they re redesigned them back in I think '74. So one of the other things in the '60s that the company did to promote sales uh, was inviting dealers and their customers to come back to the factories to see how the tractors and combines were built. And uh, so I remember in the late 60s, my grandfather took a group of people, his customers, uh, our customers, back to Rock Island to see the farm all works. This is a brochure from, from that time, and uh, actually 71, actually, because they got 66 series. But I remember my grandpa taking his group of farmers back, and I wanted to go so bad. And, uh, but I was school, I couldn't go. You know, Mama said, oh, you got to go to school. I couldn't go. So, Anyway, some years later, we were starting to plan, in 1971, we were planning our first family vacation together, my mom and dad and I. And uh, we were going to go to Chicago. Well, I found out about it, I don't know, they asked me what I wanted to see, and I said, Farmo. <laughs> that was all, <laughs> that's all I wanted, I wanted to go see Farmo. The second place I wanted to go was Louisville, to see the Cub Cadet. <laughs> anyway, so, the uh, 71, we, we set off to go to Chica or Chicago, and my mom wrote in before we left to the company to say, you know, we're going to be arriving in Rock Island on a given day, and, and uh, we'd like a tour of the factory. And anyway, we left, and while we were gone, my granddad gets a call from Pharma Works, and they're asking, well, we got this letter here from you about wanting, asking for a tour, and we only have one question, is how old is your grandson, or the boy? And, my grandpa said, oh, he's nine years old. Oh, well, policy, our policy is you had to be like 10 or 12 to go. <laughs> My grandpa said, well, you're going to have one disappointed little boy on your hands if you don't let him go through that factory. So we get to the Rock Island, and uh, they told us, well, you were going to make, you know, it's not policy that we'd allow your son, who's too young, really, to go through, but we're going to make an exception and allow him to go through. So I got to go through the farm works. And that was a life-changing experience for me. I just love seeing all those tractors being coming together. Uh, they started, I remember walking in, we went into one area where they're making gears and uh, other machine parts. Uh, they had a, a multi-axis drill presses, just one operation, all these holes would be drilled, boom, instant. And then uh, making the gears, they had the induction hardening process. And like all of a sudden this gear would just start glowing red. Like, how does it do that? I never could figure that out. <laughs> it, was, it was magic to me. And uh, I just remember that trip very much, uh, going through the farmall plant. We got done at the farmall plant and then the the guy, tour guide asked us, well, uh, if you guys got time, would you like to go see the East Moline plant? Because it was just across the river. And I said, sure. <laughs> so we went to uh, East Moline and went through the combine factory then, too. Uh, the next slide shows uh, some of the little handouts we got there. Some post a postcard there shows a little area view of the East Moline plant. Uh, and then there's a little booklet that they gave us. It was uh, like a little... Yeah, it had an open house there, and it was like a tour guide to walk through the, the plant. So we got to, I remember seeing the old, uh, they had this old Daystrom uh, sheet metal press that was cutting all the metal, bang, 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 it was making all these noise. And I remember another thing I saw there, they were stamping, they had a lot of uh, presses there in East Moline to stamp sheet metal parts, because they had a lot of sheet metal combines, but also they were stamping uh, the foot plates for Cub Cadets there. And I remember seeing them, them stamping those foot plates on the, that go on the Cub Cadets. So I recognize it. Hey, that's the foot plates on the Cub Cadets. <laughs> so anyway, it was, it was great to do that. And 
probably had a lot from uh, a lot to me for me going into engineering. I'm an engineer by profession, and I think that factory tour had a lot to do with that. So, so in the 70s, some of the things at the dealership, uh, we did give up the truck contract finally in 78. Uh, there in the later 70s, well, the international quit making pickups in uh, 75, and. Uh, for some reason in the, the late 70s, later 70s, we just could not sell trucks anymore. The, the Chevys were kind of just taken over. I don't know why, the price was too high or what, but uh, uh, we finally gave up the truck contract. Uh, we did a parts re uh, remodel of the parts department. Actually, we expanded the parts department. Um, my dad had a philosophy that if a part broke for a customer, he'd order one to get the customer back in the field, but he didn't order one to stop. So over the years, we accumulated a large amount of parts. And uh, also, my dad was very, uh, uh, you know, have, you know, promotional programs periodically for oil and disc blades and uh, plows, uh, uh, chisel, well, sweeps, that's what I'm trying to think. Uh, and he would take advantage of those ordering opportunities. If you order a minimum quantity, you get some volume discount pricing. And, and so we, we took advantage of that to have, have things in stock. And I remember uh, a lot of times in this, during Saturday in the harvest uh, time, uh, for wheat harvest uh, especially, we'd get calls from, from farmers from Kansas, uh, South Dakota, looking for parts for the old, com old combines. And uh, we typically, a lot of times, would have those parts. And they'd say, well, I'll be there about midnight. And my dad tell them where to come. They had them come to the house, and they'd, they'd come in to the house and knock on the door. And my dad get up and, and get the parts to them and get them back on their way and so they get their combines working. So. Uh, um, I kind of started, as I was getting old enough then, I could start helping in the uh, dealership uh, with housekeeping and cup cadets were kind of my thing. I, I did the service and set up on those, learned how to do that. Um, we did, uh, I was mowing the lots too, keeping the grass mowed and weeds and, and uh, learning how to do repairs and learning the business. And later 70s, I started going with grandpa on sales calls. He was trying to teach me how to sell and I went to some sales training and, uh, and also I uh, got my second scout in 76 and I got old enough to drive. So <laughs> little scout here. One of the other things uh, with the Kansas City office, uh, well, the company, I should say, uh, the more consolidation. So the Omaha, in 73, the Omaha district office was closed. And that was very disappointing for a lot of us Nebraska dealers because a lot of us relied on that and getting equipment and stuff out of Omaha. And I have a lot of memories of me and my dad, we were riding together on the big, big truck up to Omaha to get, get equipment. And uh, so they closed that in 73 and they consolidated it all into Kansas City. And that's when the Kansas City regional office was formed. It was right next to the parts depot there in Kansas City. Uh, and basically it became a, a five state region, uh, including uh, Wyoming and Colorado, Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri. So it's a pretty broad region. And um, they also closed an office in Denver. So you can imagine we Nebraska dealers were disappointed that they closed the Omaha district. I will think of the, the Colorado and Wyoming dealers when they closed the Denver office. So, and put that in to Kansas City. So. Uh, uh, they had a long ways to go to, to get, get uh, equipment if they needed to go to Kansas City. Uh, some of the new products that came out uh, in the 70s were the S Series 66 tractors and then the 86 Series in 76. Uh, 400 cycle air planners were introduced. Axle flow combines were introduced in 77 and the 2 plus 2 tractors in 79. And I was blessed with the opportunity to go with my grandfather to several of these new product introductions. The, the Series 86 tractors in Chicago uh, the Axiflow Combine in Kansas City, the, 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 ax the introductions for the Axiflow Combine were done by each regional <coughs> office. So Kansas City had everybody come to Kansas City for that. And then in uh, the Series 88, the 2 plus 2 tractors, those were actually introduced down in Phoenix. So we all went down, all the dealers came to Phoenix for that. Um, the regional office was managed by a man named Max McAllister. He was the regional office. Dan, I know Dan, you know him well. Oh, yeah. Dan, uh, Max had this uh, saying that he always, about leadership. He said, either lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way. <laughs> and, uh, uh, that's what he said. <laughs> and, uh, uh, he, uh, he was a very affable guy. I met him, Max, once or twice. I remember uh, one time uh, at the, when they were doing the, started the Red Power Showdown initiative in 78. Uh, he, he was down there, and we had a little parking lot meeting with him after that was over. And he was telling us that he got a waiver, approval from corporate for a waiver of finance. And uh, so, uh, Anyway, Max was a very likable guy, very fine gentleman. Um, when the Kansas City office was, was in, in, or created, they had an organizational meeting, and you see a couple of people there that went pretty high up in the company. Uh, Pat Kane, 
Uh, he became uh, general manager for truck, or kind of head over to trucks, I think, in the 80s, uh, or late 70s, and then uh, Stan Lancaster was also there for that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, here's uh, some of the pictures of the first two axial flow combines that came into our dealership in 78. I, I thought that was a really neat thing, and I, I had my little Instamatic Kodak and took pictures of it. Uh, so there was a 1440 on, the, on uh, your uh, left, and on the right there is the, four, the first 1480 that came into our dealership. We had both of those combines sold to customers before they ever arrived. So uh, that said a lot for the axle flow combine. The customers were buying them unseen, and it was a very revolutionary combine. And there's the other side of the 1480. Today we'd say, hey, can you supersize that? <laughs> it was a big combine. One of the, the, the wheels on that, that combine were special wheels for shipping only. Uh, we had to ship those actually back to East Moline, and the regular wheels that went on that combine were actually on the flat car. And uh, so, uh, they, and then one other story about the 1480s, when the first 1480 rolled off the line at East Moline, they couldn't get it through the door at the end of the line. They had to widen the door to make, make it, you know, get the combine out the, fa out of the factory. So, um, one other thing, uh, you know, every dealership success also depends a lot on the employees that work for you. And uh, we were blessed to have a number of employees working for us over the years. And this is, let's recognize those employees, uh, here are the, their names. And uh, also uh, this, uh, some of their families. I found some pictures of some of the, these employees and their families. You know, the families have a lot to do with the success as well, because without their support, when the, you know you have a tractor that's broke down, you have to work late to get it, keep it in the field, get it back, back in service. Uh, you know, the families have to help support that, and, and uh, we appreciate all their support. So, also like to recognize a couple of the uh, employees from International that I remember and that were kind of special to us. Uh, George Liebers was our zone man for many years during the, the 70s. Uh, we worked with him, and he always had me doing some little special projects for him. You know, he sweep the floor, or, or uh, we, we had some bricks. He wanted to build a patio on the back of his house. He lived over in Beatrice, Nebraska. So he found out there was all, by the old railroad tracks, there was all these old bricks, and he had me dig out all those old bricks. It was a little sidewalk, and, and uh, we loaded them all up on a, and hauled them over to his place. And Claude Noko was another uh, zone manager that uh, Support our dealership back in the late 60s. Roy Carpenter, uh, he was a territory service manager at TSM, and he was based out of York, Nebraska, and uh, he uh, he helped us on a lot of troubleshooting problems. Get that? Yeah, and, it's, and it should be noted that he played a principal, a major role in developing the Pro Harvest Support Program, okay. and he worked with us for 10 years after retirement. Yeah. Okay. And uh, thank you, Dan. And uh, another guy was Cal Rampage. He was a stockman. And I remember him from the Omaha district office, and to me, he was a stockman stockman. He knew exactly what was in that warehouse and where it was at, and he, he didn't have to hardly look at the paper, the computer printouts on his desk at all. He was just, he was just an amazing man to me. Um, give you a last thing, we'll get out down here, uh, give you an inside look at some of the dealership operations or record keeping. Uh, here is, you know, we had manual accounting back in those days. They had this before computers came out or PCs or anything like that. You had mainframe, but you know, uh, we, we didn't get into that. <laughs> anyway, here, so every, every sales ticket was basically a transaction. And uh, I brought some sales tickets here. If anybody you want a copy of the sales ticket from our dealership, <laughs> you're welcome to. I got the old, cat, old ticket, ticket register here I brought along. <laughs> so we can, uh, I can write your name in there and, and address, and you can have uh, your own personal <laughs> sales ticket from Shin Implements. <laughs> Um, so anyway, every, every ticket was a uh, transaction. It had to be posted. My mom every week would have to do posting of all these tickets that came in during that week. If it was something that got charged, you know, we went on here, you put the, the ticket number and the amount they owed, and uh, we kept the running total there. So when the customer would come in and want to pay for it, then uh, set up like at the end of the year or end of the month, then they could do that. Um, this is from uh, the price list for parts. Every, you know, that was the Bible for parts and what the pricing was. It had two different price lists. There was a, there was a regular black edition, which was the, the fast selling parts, and then you had the slower moving parts, which was a green edition. And uh, so there shows what kind of what they look like, and kind of a close up, you see the part numbers and what the list price was. Now, also, they had sometimes they, back in the 70s, sort of kind of contract pricing, which you could offer some of your better customers discounts on some of the pricing. And, uh, and then on the far right, it was actually you could, if you can figure it out, there's you could tell what the net cost was so, <laughs> for the dealer. <laughs> so 
you leave out the letter, you can kind of figure out what the net cost was. So, um, so there's a price list out of just uh, the regular price equipment, farm equipment price list. So here we got, uh, what is this, a 1086 or 1586 tractor. Uh, it, every tractor or every item had either kind, a kind and a cold number, which told you what it was. Uh, the cold number, depending on the years, the, the cold number would change from year to year. And uh, that also has a bearing on, if you look at your serial number, that's how you can tell what year it is. If you have all the pricing data, you can figure out what year it was, because uh, that, that code number 154 would be in the serial number the first part of the serial number on that so um, so there you see what the list price was you can see all the option codes for as you see the different alternate tires you could order of course hydro extra hydraulic outlets and all those different things you could add weight brackets uh, also the uh, other box there right next to the code number that's uh, if you know how to read it that's uh, you figure out what the net price price to the dealer was so if you eliminate the letter, you can see what the net price is. So when you wanted to order a new tractor, uh, the dealer wanted to order a new tractor, first step is they had to fill out a J99 form. You get with your blockman, they fill out this J99 form, spec it out what you wanted. I'd go into the regional office, and the regional office and entered into the computer, and then you'd get a printout back of that when it was entered. It tells you, know, okay, where the factory origin is going to be. It's kind of a line setting ticket almost for, for like in, in ag. Uh, how it's going to be shipped, usually shipped by truck, TL hunt, uh, the, uh, you know, name of the dealership. And then this is your opportunity to check the order and make sure they had it spec right, that you got everything you wanted, that they didn't get something entered by mistake. So then once the tractor was actually built, it was invoiced uh, to the dealer. So you'd receive here on the, the uh, your left is, is an invoice, an example of an invoice and uh, has the dealer net cost on there, what it cost the dealer. Also, you had to keep track of the shipping cost to, to the dealership as well, because the dealer had to pay that. Also, that upper box there in the middle, they had a couple important dates. You had an interest bearing date, and then uh, then when, if the dealer floor planned it, the date that he'd have to pay 90%, and then uh, I think the final 10% was due on, a, on another date. So usually you get like 12 or 18 months to floor plan but you'd have to start paying interest on it. Now, if you paid early, it's like, well, we try to pay cash for most all of our equipment. And uh, so if you pay early, the company actually would give you a little rebate back. They called it prepay. So if you paid it, if you didn't floor plan it, and we, we tried to do that as much as we could. Uh, as far as I remember, especially my mom was running the book, she tried to make sure everything was paid. And so that, we'd, we'd collect interest in on that money. They'd give, come and give you a little rebate back on that. And that, sometimes, that year, some years that made a difference, uh, you know, between having a profit and loss. So. And then finally, so you get the tractor on the lot, then you, you know, the goal is to get a retail order. So here's an example of a retail order form that we had from that time. And uh, McCormick uh, International was one of the first companies to have like kind of standard form for retail orders. And uh, so this was from the back in the 70s, but I know uh, I remember Von Allen talking about how Cyrus McCormick was, uh, you know, very instrumental in having a you know, common form and has all the legalese on it that needs to be there. So. Here's some old ads from uh, our dealership that I, some newspaper clippings I came across, uh, thought I'd share. Um, frequently in our hometown, when a new business would open up, they'd have all the dealers or all the businesses would, they'd put out a little flyer that, to get all the local face patrons and customers through the mail. We sent out this little newspaper flyer, and, and so that's where some of these came from. And they said, you know, good luck, Strope. That was Arnie Strope, who run the bar at that time. And <laughs> so, anyway, uh, all good things. Unfortunately, you have to come to an end. And uh, my grandfather passed away in 1980, October 1980, uh, after a long battle with leukemia. And that ended our contract with IH. Uh, I said earlier that I mean, back in the 50s, when my dad joined the business, they didn't get his name added to the contract at that time. Uh, and so, and then years, some years later, my grandpa talked to the company about adding my dad to the contract. And by that time, they didn't want dealers in small towns anymore. And so uh, they said, well, if you want to move to the county seat, which would have been Fairbury, uh, we could look at that. But they don't have built on a new building and stuff. My gran grandpa said, no, I don't want to do this. And he saw, he, in the northern part of the county is where all the farmland was. The southern part of the county is more uh, rolling hills and uh, pasture. So there wasn't as much you know, farming down in that area. He says, no, you'll never be able to keep a dealer in, in the county seat of Fairbury. And to this day, he's been, those words have proved true. 
that uh, after we closed our business, they did put a dealer in Fairbury for uh, a couple years and they closed uh, back in the 80s. Uh, there used to be a John Deere dealer in Fairbury. It's closed. There used to be a Massey Ferguson dealer in Fairbury. It's closed. Uh, so it, it, there's no, actually today, there's no dealer in Fairbury. There's no implement dealer in Fairbury. So my grandpa knew where the, where the customers were and where, that's where we wanted to be. So, uh, so after he passed away, that ended our contract. It took about two years for us to shut down the business, get our parts all inventory and returned uh, within that first year. We shipped out all the parts. We had over three semi loads, oh, three semi loads of track uh, parts. It went either most of them went back to Kansas City, uh, some of them went back. There was half a truckload that went back to uh, Broadview, uh, and then we had two auctions to uh, shut down the business. So, but anyway, my grandfather, I would like to thank you for your participation here today, uh, in sharing our experience about our family's dealership, and uh, thank you for visiting. So, any questions? <laughs> We have uh, displays over here on the, some of the pictures you've seen on the presentation are over here on the board if you'd like to look more of them. If you want a ticket at, over here, a sales ticket, I'd be happy to give you a sales ticket. And uh, so thank you for coming. So, yes? How many people did they employ? The, uh, we usually would have, uh, we had one key mechanic uh, and then a couple helpers. Um, so. And then we had some part-time help. So like uh, Auto Journey, he was part-time help. Ed Mooseman was another guy that would do the swathing for us in the summers. Uh, you know, they, so some of these guys were retired and uh, this is some odd man jobs. But yeah, generally we had a, a most three to four employees on the full-time staff, so. Yes, sir. Did the county ever get their, did the, they ever get the money from the county? Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> mom, mom made sure we got our money. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Do you want a picture of him and her together? Yeah. Okay. All right. You want your name on her? Yeah. Okay. I worked for a dealer in southern Indiana from 76 to 82. Ben? Ben Chestnut. E S T is that enough light? I could probably turn it up higher if that's. Yeah, customer was first. Stay late, whatever. You get up at that. You're going to be here at midnight. You come to my house. If you have that, don't have that. Not once. This is his car. Oh, yeah. Very good. I brought mine all Bill, he just got like her. <laughs> oh, I, I got a, I got a picture of the, what do you call it? You're going to get the job getting it out this time. It's working better now. Yeah, it did. It. It there you go. A little go. bit of oil would really be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Excuse me. Sure. Uh, 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 over here. S-E-Y. M-O-U-R. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I can get my stuff up here. I was waiting for the projector to shut down. But I think it's like the train is coming on. Did you get the ball? Yeah. I think it's. I think it's. Yeah, 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 are you in line, sir? Nope, I'm no. just going to, I just would have had. observant. Huh? Well, he, this Dakin is just it's shortly, we're pretty close to where I farm, too. Oh, okay. And okay. so I was just going to just touch base there. with this guy. Yeah, yeah. I, we yeah. never dealt with Smith. Yeah, you oh, okay. kind of a unique uh, deal. I just, yeah. Yeah. Our dealer was yeah. DeWitt. Thank you very much. Green uh, Brothers. Huh? Yeah. Green Brothers. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And so it was just kind of interesting. What's your name? I, uh, uh, Bill. Bill? Okay. Uh, I didn't know uh, that he was going to do this. I didn't know that he was from Dakin, Nebraska. Oh, okay. So that's kind of my name. Oh, it is.
bit. Is there? <laughs> well, I, well, my farm's halfway between uh, Beatrice and Plymouth. And my collection. I'm a paper, paper collector, so that'd be, uh, that'd be kind of neat for me. Thank you very much, Ron. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Great, great, uh, great seminar, too. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. Good farm you, praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? Oops, get your hat on. We're on. Oh. <laughs> So what did you think, Mom, about the presentation? Was it good? Oh, it was good. <laughs> did you bring back a lot of memories for you? Yeah. Yeah? Remember all those pictures, a lot of those pictures, I bet. I don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you could be here to see it, Mom. Oh, isn't it was, that wonderful? You bet. Well, it's praise the Lord that you were able to be here. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you did all the accounting for the dealership, yes? But she asked him back, thank you. So she's asking, did, you did all the accounting for the dealership, right? All the bookkeeping? Yeah, we did a lot of bookkeeping. All by hand. Yeah. All by hand, yep. You remember how you used to post those tickets every week? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> she used to teach accounting. Yeah. I did oh. too. Yeah. You taught accounting. That's yeah. interesting. Mom wow. was a school teacher for, she taught at high school, grade school, and one room school houses. She started in one room school house. She uh, then moved up to uh, high school and then she went on getting her degree, got her master's degree, and then taught in a, at a community college for many years after that. So I she set up the. You set up the real estate curriculum there at the college? Right? You right. set up the real estate curriculum at the college? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, so she did a lot, of, a lot of things, taught a lot of students over the years, so. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, he's wash, I always, Ronnie and I'd always wash his toys from the sandbox <laughs> so they wouldn't get rusty. I always had to put my toys away at night. <laughs> yeah, and Grandpa died and then Ron had to go to the last meeting. He was, Ron was supposed to go and Ron, and Daddy was dead, so Ron had to go. But Ron was up there at college, so he went. He went to that meeting, but he had lost Grandpa in death. Yeah, we got a. I got a, a, a plaque for a, a sales plaque for we were at a, a sales stars program that the company was doing, and uh, I had. Grandpa and I had sold enough tractors and whatever that I qualified for an award for that oh, presentation. That's great. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> it's really interesting. Well, thank you so much for your time today, both of you. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. That was good.